So friends, we are living under a lot of new rules these days, aren't we? Masks and even more hand washing than usual and social distancing. And I have to tell you that my inner hall monitor is going strong these days. My desire to correct mask wearing to the proper way, not below your nose or just hanging off your ear and demonstrate how far apart six feet really is, makes me a real treat to be around these days. Luckily, I don't go out much, so I don't get in too much trouble for my hall monitor tendencies, but wow, do I ever get the folks in the New Testament who are obsessed with the rules and obsessed with figuring out the rules relationship to Jesus. And their love of the rules actually makes it really hard for them to deal with Jesus. And it's sometimes hard for me to deal with Jesus too, because Jesus doesn't always care about all the usual rules, or at least doesn't think they're all the most important thing. Everyone in our story from the gospel today knows the laws are important, and they ask Jesus a lot of questions about how they ought to live before we get to the part that we read today. But they also know that some are more important than others, and they want to know what Jesus thinks, because what Jesus says about them must be really important and must be helpful in knowing what the most important thing is. So a few years before I started seminary, there was a project undertaken that was trying to get at the same question, I think. It was Bible scholars who were trying to figure out what was really knowable about Jesus as a historical person. And so the scholars would take the Gospels verse by verse and vote as to which things they thought Jesus actually said and which ones probably not. And there was more to it than that, and it's perhaps a worthy academic endeavor? I don't know. It's just not a question that I find personally interesting at all. And so I never really got into it. I don't really care that much, actually, about what's historically accurate when it comes to what Jesus says. And I'm a little suspicious of how that would be provable anyway. But I have to say there's some other things like that that I would be super down for. And it would be If scholars got together, and I would like to be included in this one, and start voting on which of Jesus' teachings were done more or less with his eyes rolled. There are just some texts where I feel like I can almost hear the annoyance in his voice. And maybe it's projection because I would be annoyed by people asking the same questions over and over. But think about some of the stories we have about Jesus with his people. Like on the way to Jerusalem, he's telling his disciples that he's about to be betrayed and handed over to the authorities and put on trial and brutally killed. And he's going to rise again in three days. And they're like, hey, when your kingdom comes, will I be seated at your right hand or will this guy over here? And I can just almost feel Jesus rolling his eyes. And I feel like today's text has a little undercurrent of I can't believe I have to keep telling you this, but he does. Jesus has to keep telling us over and over the things that are most important because we, like the people who first heard them, are forgetful people. So we need to hear what it means to uphold this commandment or commandments since he gives two that are the most important, that we love the Lord our God with all our heart and all our soul and all our strength and that we love our neighbor as ourselves. Because we so easily get bogged down in details, we can fail to see the big picture even when it's painted in giant letters outside of our church. Now, growing up, I was taught this story, and I was taught about God's law, especially the Ten Commandments, that there are things, the Ten Commandments in particular, but all of God's laws are sort of a prescription from God for how we live our lives. Basically, the importance of the Bible is that it gives us all the rules we have to keep so that we're right with God. At least that was the language we used. God gave us these rules and a bunch of others that the church added along the way because we needed them. And they're there because God loves us and wants us to be happy. But I've grown to see it a little differently. And Nadia boltz helped me name it when she said that the law is less about God loves you and wants you to be happy and more about the fact that God loves your neighbor and wants to protect them from you. And God loves and wants to protect you insofar that you are someone's neighbor. Meaning that this strange God we have who created the world and spoke through fiery prophets and freed people from slavery and gave them the law 
and said they were his, the same God who came to us in the person of Jesus and who loved people so completely. This God is strange, but what God is not is distant. So God didn't just create the whole world and do all that stuff just to give us some rules and then leave us to it. Because what we see in the life and teachings of Jesus is that people matter and human relationships matter to God. And the way we're treated matters to God. Whether or not we show compassion to one another matters to God. God is not far off just waiting to see if we'll follow the rules. But the way that people are cared for matters to God. And so some laws are established for that. But Jesus says over and over that the laws are made for us and not us for the laws. And so there's a spirit to the law that trumps the letter of it, which I know may sound like slipping a little bit dangerously into a kind of moral relativism that I've learned we don't have a lot of tolerance for, but so be it, I guess, for today, because our obsession with moral absolutes comes from clinging to the letter of the law as though it could love and save us when that's what Jesus is for, as though the letter of the law is the only way we can experience justice and righteousness in the world, and that's what Jesus is for. And do you know who got in trouble kind of all the time for breaking the letter of the law? Jesus. A lot, actually. And the people around Jesus are like your kids that have been cooped up in the house together for too long. Hey, Jesus, your disciples aren't washing their hands. Hey, Jesus, why are you eating with sinners? Hey, Jesus, we saw you heal a guy on the Sabbath. And Jesus has no patience for this. We were made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was not made for us, he would say, and that would usually shut them up at least until the next time. The default mode of the law for Jesus is love. What it all comes down to is love for God, love for neighbor, love for ourselves. Even on a really good day, I can usually only get two out of three of those at the same time. Sometimes only one, sometimes maybe less. And I think my greatest teacher in coming to know how these three, loving God, loving neighbor, and loving ourselves are related, is Father Greg Boyle of Homeboy Industries. And he's helped me in countless ways. You've heard me talk about him many times, but none more so than helping me come to see that the opposite of judgment is awe. Awe, A-W-E, a word we don't use enough, I think. The opposite of judgment is awe. And that awe leads us to boundless compassion that reflects God's love. He says we have to stand in awe at what people carry rather than in judgment of how they carry it. And he tells a lot of stories. I've been reading this past week his newer book, Barking to the Choir, which I know some of you have read, and I'd recommend it if you haven't. But he tells stories in his books about uh, the men and women he's come to know through Homeboy Industries, all folks uh, coming from a life of gang activity or out of prison uh, that come and find a place of grace and healing at Homeboy. And he always takes, if he goes on speaking engagements, he takes people with him. So he tells this story about going to speak to 600 social workers in Richmond, Virginia, uh, an engagement that he'd said yes to without reading the details carefully and thought he was going to give a lunchtime address, but turns out he'd agreed to give an, a day-long in-service from nine to five on gang intervention and discovered that about a week before he was supposed to fly out. And so uh, he invites a couple of the guys into his office and says they're going with them. And so DeAndre and Sergio load up onto the plane to Richmond and stand up before the audience. And Sergio begins to tell a story. And I'm just going to read you a bit of it. So Sergio began his story in an offhanded way. I guess you could say my mom and me, we didn't get along so good. I think I was six when she looked at me and said, why don't you just kill yourself? You're such a burden to me. And 600 social workers gasped in unison. And Sergio fanned his hands like he was trying to put out a fire. Sounds way worse in Spanish, she said. And everyone laughed. We all got whiplash moving from gasp to laugh. He's one sentence into his story and everyone needs a laugh. 
I think I was like nine years old, Sergio continued, when she drove me into the deepest part of Baja, California, walked me to the door of this orphanage and said, hey, I found this kid. And he paused and his voice began to buckle. I was there 90 days before my, my grandmother could get out of my mom where she dumped me. And my grandmother came and rescued me. He searched for what to say next. My mom beat me every single day of my elementary school years with things you can imagine and a lot of things you couldn't. Every day I was bloodied and scarred. In fact, I had to wear three t-shirts to school every day. The first one because the blood would seep through and the second because you could still see it. But with the third one, you couldn't see it anymore. The kids at school would make fun of me. Hey, it's 100 degrees. Why are you wearing three t-shirts? And he paused again so his emotions could catch up to him, momentarily knocking the wind out of his speech. For a time, he seemed to be staring at a piece of his story that only he could see. I wore three t-shirts, he finally said, swallowing back his tears well into my adult years because I was ashamed of my wounds. I didn't want no one to see him. And then he suddenly found a higher perch upon which to rest and said, but now I welcome my wounds. I went, run my fingers over my scars. My wounds are my friends. After all, he continued, barely getting out the words, how can I help others heal if I don't welcome my own wounds? And awe came upon everyone. Father Greg goes on to say that we must learn to drop the burden of our own judgments, reconciling what the mind wants to separate, that what the mind wants to separate, the heart should bring together. Dropping this enormous inner burden of judgment allows us to make of ourselves what God wants the world to ultimately be, people who stand in awe. Judgment, after all, takes up all the room you need for loving. It's a hard but a miraculous story, friends, of how Sergio came to love himself and others, how he came to show grace to himself and others, how he came to stand in awe of himself and then of others. And awe has been a little hard to come by these days when we don't leave our houses much and don't go much of anywhere and things are getting dull and frustrating and hard to deal with and... I know when that's true for me, when I'm having a hard time finding myself in awe of things, I can get pretty stingy with love and grace, first toward myself, but then toward others too. And when I want to hide or judge my own wounds or judge myself for the way that I'm doing things, well, then I can't help others. So this week, I'm on, a, on the lookout for awe, friends, and I invite you to join me. It seems like love should be so easy and obvious that this commandment is said to us with Jesus' rolled eyes, having to repeat himself again and again. But he repeats it because it's so important and so hard for us to remember. So write yourself a note this week and remember to be in awe, to look around you at the amazing things that people can carry, including you to withhold judgment about the way people are carrying their loads, including you, and to see those around you with God's eyes, everyone, including you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.